<laughs> Buddy. My name is Mars Raymer, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Man, them speakers are something awesome, aren't they? I'm, I, I'll be talking way back here in a minute. I get all lathered up, and you guys will be backing up. I'll, we'll just, might have to turn that down just a little bit. <laughs> oh. Just for the record, I put the coat on and took it off in the same 15-second interval like that. I just, I, I'm going to be sweaty enough as it is without having a coat on there, too. So I just, uh, God, what a cool deal. We've been two years trying to get all this stuff worked out schedule-wise so we could make this happen, and, and we finally got it all done, and I've been looking forward to it. It's like being, it's like old home week. I didn't, I remember a day when I didn't know anybody in California. I didn't, even, I didn't even know anybody outside of Texas. And it's and it, it just, all of a sudden, I, I walk in and there's just jillions of you guys that I already know, that I've emailed with, I've talked to, and it, it's just like, uh, it's like being in a room with a bunch of friends. And it's also, it's, it's, it's really kind of nice because we get an opportunity to do some things. Uh, a lot of times these workshops are set up on day, day deals. They're not, they don't go a weekend, they just go one, one day. We start early in the morning. And there's not any time to kind of grease the skids any. There's not any time to talk about how we got here or what the real what the reason is for doing it and it, it everybody assumes well we're just going to do the steps and this sort of thing but it's a little different and and we're gonna we're gonna this this cat sacrifice thing we're going to do it's going to take some explaining and it's just like <laughs> no. thank god get you guys full of pasta and y'all just go to sleep i was just gonna like <laughs> hell oh shit Guys, my home group is the primary purpose group in Dallas, Texas, and, and I, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here. I want to thank David for picking us up and that girl from Australia that, whose name I can't pronounce. Ed, she's <laughs> What a sweetheart. What a sweetheart. Um, it says God's country. This is the coolest thing in the world. If we could just figure out a way to get the roads straight. I just... <laughs> well, I don't know whether to talk or blow beats still. It's just like... <laughs> It's just, in Texas, you can drive 300 miles and never turn. <laughs> you don't even, you drink a six pack and play cards and it's still driving straight and you're just like, God damn. <laughs> God damn. I don't know who invented the roads. It must have been Satan. It was certainly somebody that doesn't get sick in the, in the, in the car. And I kept thinking, if this thing is 10 more miles up the road, I'm screwed and so is everybody around me because I'm just going <laughs> to. All right. Um, I'll be brief. I, I know most of you guys travel today, and if you're like me, my day started at 4 a.m. I had to work this morning before I went to the airport, and so the, the, it's now in Texas, one hour past my bedtime. So I'll be brief if for nothing else that I'm getting tired and sleepy. Um, it, you know, um, any of you guys have, have parents that were drunks, uh, relative people, f family members like this? A lot of us do. A lot of us grew up with family members that were alcoholics. And, and it's, like, it's like the mantra of every kid growing up in an alcoholic home. I said, I'll never do that. Ever will I do that. And, and that was my deal. And I didn't. I stayed completely clear of the booze all the way through, almost through high school. <laughs> One night. Pat Robinson buys this brand new uh, Camaro, yellow, canary yellow. With I mean, it's the coolest car I'd ever seen in my whole life. I'm a little country boy from the hill country of Texas, and we didn't have fancy cars, and this was a fancy car, man. And so he wants to go to uh, Fredericksburg down the road, 23 miles, which is our arch rivals, and watch this basketball game, and I think I'm in heaven. It's real cold. It's November. It's, it's kind of misting and stuff outside, and I'll never forget the night as long as I live. I get in the car. Pat says, hey, I got a surprise, and he opens up this thing, and there's a cooler of beer in there. And I went, just, just a six-pack, and I'm thinking, well, why not? And so we drive almost to Fredericksburg and stop, get one of these little babies out, and I um, crack one of these things. He drinks one, and we drive on to this game. We pull into the parking lot there at this stadium, and about that time this beer hits me, and I'm going, man. Hey, Pat, can I, can I borrow your car for just a second? I just want to go back and get one more of those. And he goes, well, we just come... The game that you can hear them all in there, the band and all this stuff like this. And I'm just thinking, there's girls in there, my reason for living. They don't know I exist, but they're my reason for living. And I, and I just... <laughs> <laughs> 
it would be years before I'd realize they still didn't know I existed. It's just like, <laughs> oh, shoot. It, he gives me the keys, and I go back, and I sit down on the edge of that little creek. We had dropped those beers down in a little creek there so they'd stay cold while we were in this game. And, and I drank one, and I drank another one, and he's lucky I left him any because I'm telling you, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And, I'm, and most of you guys that have been there like that, could you, could you tell me the first Coca-Cola you drank? Most of you couldn't. But I'm telling you, that beer just... I was in heaven. You guys know the, know the trip. I walked back into that parking lot and walked up to that stadium, and I'm a god. I, I, I'm telling you, I talked to every girl in that place. There wasn't any of them talk back. I mean, was, <laughs> they, they didn't even think I was amusing, but I talked to every girl in there. It was the coolest night of my whole life, and it was it was all because of that magic stuff that Pat had got. And I was off to the races, and it would be great fun for a bunch of years, for a bunch of them. And then all of a sudden it stops, the, just the nature of this deal. The, the, we won't go into a bunch of, stu- a bunch of uh, uh, stories about the stuff. Suffice to say, I, it, towards the end of this thing, uh, Chris, the evil twin Chris, had, had introduced me to the joys of outside issues which sort of sped things up if you catch my drift. And it was, just kinda, it was just kind of a nightmare all of a sudden. I mean, what was once a manageable situation, all of a sudden it wasn't manageable anymore. And because of the progressive nature of alcoholism, which I would later learn, um, uh, I'm getting sicker and sicker. The internal condition's getting pretty ugly, and it's time to stop. About the time I'm making all these realizations that maybe booze is not working anymore, Chris, <coughs> excuse me, the downfall of a mustache, Chris, the evil twin, quits drinking, stops. He, he's working at the same place that I work, and we're, we're, we're working together, and it's just like he's my best drinking buddy. I mean, we, we, I don't know what I'm going to do. He quits, and, I, and I'd love to tell you guys between me and you, and we'll get to know each other some this weekend, I'd love to tell you that I was the kindest brother in the world and that I was so proud of him for stopping drinking. The reality of it was that I was a little jerk, and I made his life miserable miserable because I just couldn't stand the idea. I'm, I'm glad that he's not hurting anymore and I'm glad that he's not a, not a fallen down drunk knife wielding maniac like he was, but he's... <laughs> but being the center of my own universe and he's gone out of it now and I just, it was just kind of a crazy sort of a gig, but um, when, when, when life, when this stuff finally got to, to its darkest, um, Chris took me to my first AA meeting. And that was three months after he sobered up. Two months after he sobered up. November, January. Two months. And uh, January, tw- January the 15th of 88, he took me to my first meeting, and it was the coolest thing I'd ever experienced in my entire life. I walked in, fell in love with you guys. That old smoke-filled room, everybody's smoking like six cigarettes, and it's just like... I was in, they, 21 years ago, there was a lot of that going on. You could, it, they, every meeting, they didn't have non-smoking meetings, and it was just the craziest place, and, and I loved every one of those cats, and, and, and it, was a, it was a cool deal. And it stayed that way for a couple of years, guys. Everything got better. Um, my wife finally moved back down to the same end of the house that I'm living in, and, and it, you know how it is. The kids finally stopped this, doing this when you walk into the room. It just, it just got better. It just it was okay. And... and and I wish, you know, I'd love to say, and, and that was it, and, and it, good night. And it, the, the problem was is that it didn't stop there. It didn't, there's something called a progressive nature of alcoholism, which we're going to spend some good time in the morning talking about. Um, and the, the meetings that we were going to were all just discussion meetings. We didn't have any book studies. We didn't have any, I wasn't encouraged to study. Uh, we, I, I wasn't encouraged to get a sponsor. I didn't have a. I finally got a sponsor because he drank, He drove a fancy car and he wore a nice suit of clothes. And I thought that's my that's my man right there. That's how I picked him. I stood on the curb and waited for the fanciest car in the joint to walk up, and that was him. The problem is, is that the stuff that we were doing in the meeting wasn't treating the internal condition, which was alcoholism. And so as a result, what happened was is I started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Now, for a meeting makers make it kind of guy, this is a baffling piece of news, and this is not something I'm comfortable with, and it's something that's fairly terrifying to me. A, I don't want to drink. I'm clear on that. B, I don't want to be back like I was when I was drinking, and that's exactly where I'm going. Um, any of you guys ever experienced that stuff? It's like the craziest thing in the world. It's the cra- I'm doing everything they're asking me to do, and day by day, I'm getting sicker and sicker and sicker. I'd l- I, I used to blame it on them. Well, you know, if those guys had known what they were doing, they'd have seen that I was getting sick. You know what? 
They had the same big book I did, and I had the same opportunity to read the book that they did, and we just, we just didn't do it. It was just not a part of what we did in that deal. Matter of fact, we had a, we had a deal one night. It was the craziest uh, group conscious meeting I've ever been to in my whole life. We decided uh, that we were going to... A guy had mentioned that he thought that we were talking about God too much in the meeting. And so he was going to make this motion that perhaps what we ought to do is not talk about God in the meeting. And so it's like... You ever been in a group conscious meeting when you really don't know what the issue is and you're just kind of like this, looking around the room, waiting for some big stick to get up there and go, yeah, I'll vote for that. And then everybody else in the room goes like that. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. And I'm sitting there like this and I'm looking around the room and I'm going, all these hands are going up and I'm going, well, maybe, maybe we are talking about God too much like this. And we voted God out of the meeting. There's nothing like good old Texas AA, buddy. I'm telling you right now. It's like, <laughs> God or Satan? God or Satan? Well, let's try Satan a while. It's just like... <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of the way it was. It, i tell you what, what was really weird about the deal, guys, was that it was just as... I know, in retrospect, I'm looking at this going, it couldn't have happened like that, but it did. It, it simply did. The meetings had gotten so toxic and we had drifted so far away from a program called alcoholism, called Alcoholics Anonymous that nobody was getting sober. People were slipping and sliding like big dogs. People were... The cr fist fights in, in meetings, it was just... It was just crazy. It was just crazy. I was in a meeting one night in that same group right after that thing like this and I... And I it, somebody said something and I heard somebody say something else and pretty soon I heard this thing go... <laughs> And I looked over there and a guy had a pistol laying up on the tabletop. Just, he, he carried it in his back and he just set it up there on the table. Well, the argument stopped. There wasn't any more argument. But, it, but this is the nature of what I'm talking about. It was just kind of crazy, wheels off sort of stuff. Years later, there were some little guys in Iceland that would start calling meetings like that dark tunnel meetings. And the moment that guy said it, I went, know exactly what you mean. Got the t-shirt for that meeting too. I know exactly what it's all about. Dark tunnel meetings. Uh, I know everything about your weed eater, everything about your grandkids, everything about the boss you hate, but I don't know one thing about how to stay sober with a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't know any of it. And as a result, I got really drunk. I mean, I got really, really goofy again. The, 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 the alcoholism, which I used to treat with, uh, with alcohol, um, now I, I can't treat it with anything except just discussion stuff. And it's getting pretty, pretty ugly. I stayed another t couple of years. Things begin to deteriorate around the old Raymer household again. I'm starting to get real physical with my family again. I'm not punching them, but I'm pushing them. If you catch, I mean, I'm just, I'm not proud of either one of them. But it's like, it's like, I'm just, everything that I did when I was drinking is coming back in spades. And it's scaring the pee out of me. I don't want to be there, guys. I don't want to do this. I'm writing hot checks all over Denton County. Every woman in the world looks better than my wife. It, I, I just... Oh. It's as uncomfortable. All of those years that I drank like a fool and did all that crazy stuff, I never one time thought about killing myself. And here I am at seven years sober. It's the only thing that seems to make sense. I cannot figure out how I can make this go away. How can I get back to where I was the first couple of years that I was in AA when things were warm and fuzzy and we all s held hands and it was all groovy? I don't... I just... I don't know. Chris had by this time moved to the hill country, got married to this little gal, and, and, uh, and he had got something called a big book sponsor. <laughs> I don't know what it was, didn't care what it was, but that's what he got. And, and, um, and he, we would talk on a regular basis, as twins are apt to do, and he would, I would tell him what was going on, and he kept saying, I've been telling you for years, get out of that group and go find you a place where they'll study the literature. Go get you a place where they will talk solution in a meeting instead of a bunch of weird stuff. And eventually I would, but it would get real close first. I almost drank one night. I called Chris, and he said, listen, don't, I'm going to be in town in a couple of days, and I'm going to be there with a guy, and we're, gonna, we, we're supposed to meet some people. And I understand, I'm not sure about this guy, but I understand that he's the guy you're looking for, and I'll kind of feel the thing out and see, and I'll give you a holler if it is. And he did. True to his word, he called me, and he said, he said this guy is, is it, man. He's the, he's the cat's meow, and he's a mean old SOB, and he's exactly what you need. Here's his number. 
And I, guys, I'll never forget it as long as I live. You know, what I, you know what I said? I said, Chris, man, I'm so busy right now. I got all this stuff going on. And I just kind of, And there's like dead air on the end of the phone. And Chris goes, it hadn't been 48 hours ago that you were telling me that you were thinking about killing yourself. You're going to drink and you know you're going to drink. Your family hates you. Everything is falling apart. And now you're too busy to go see this guy? Click. Where's the love, man? Yeah, I got it. It just takes me a few years to realize it. So I go see this old guy, and, I, and I'm, I'm telling you this. I wanna, let me do let one little side road here. This may not resemble your story at all. Next week you can get up here and do this exact same thing. It, it's important that you understand, though, why I relate this. Some of you are going like, I don't understand why he's talking about all this stuff. It's important because you'll understand because it, because it colored in a very dramatic way everything that would happen in my AA existence from then on. It would affect everything that I did, everything that I said, everybody I worked with. It would affect everything. And we'll connect it all up and you'll see sort of, sort of what I'm talking about. I am always envious of people that come into AA, get sober, and, 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 and sing Kumbaya with their groups every night. And it's all just warm and fuzzy. I love that. And I, hope, I wish it was like that everywhere. The funny part about this is, guys, is that the more I travel, the more I'm around, the more meetings I go to other places, I begin to see that there are a lot of people getting their butts kicked in AA. And that's the part that scares me. And we'll talk a little bit about that this weekend um, in case it happens. That, I understand that some of you guys it hadn't happened to yet. It may never happen to. Remember, there was a time when I was all warm and fuzzy with just sitting there talking about your weed eater. I was okay with all of that. I was. I was. Unfortunately, it changed. And so if it changes for you, you can remember this scrawny kid from Texas that talked about this deal because the solution was right in front of me. And it was just going to take a little effort on my part to get where I needed to get. So Krusty Cliff is sitting right there at the door. I knock on the door and he opens the door and he scares the bejesus out of me right off the bat. He's like a million years old and he's just like... <laughs> and he's one of these kind of guys that he just... Uh, he just loved me into his house, and he, no, if any of you guys know Cliff Bishop, you know that's not what happened at all. Some of you know him. Uh, he says, uh, where's your big book? I said, I ain't got a clue. And he said, well, here's mine. Don't ever come back over here without it. And he turned around and he walked away. Guys, I gotta, you got to make sure you understand this. He didn't say, hey, my name is Cliff Bishop. Welcome to my home. Thank you for coming over. He didn't say, he just turned around and walked away from me. And I'm standing at the turning point. I'm standing on his front porch looking at him as his back goes down through this hallway. And I'm looking at my truck parked out there on the curb. And I'm thinking, there, I'm telling you guys, there's this much of me that wants to just run into the truck. And I'm thinking, he's too old to catch me. He, he doesn't even know who I am really. He, doesn't, he can't come get me. I'm out of here. And there was something deep inside though that said, you know what, Myers? Maybe this crusty old guy knows what he's talking about. Maybe... He has the solution. So I went inside, and in 45 minutes, this guy sitting on his couch started reading the big book to me. And he'd read something, and he'd ask me a question. And I'd try to come up with some <laughs> crappy one-liner. And I, just, I, just, I, I was just giving him my best stuff. I was giving him everything I knew about AA. I was giving him. I was just, he'd ask me another question, and I'd say, well, you know, there are many kinds of... And he'd go, no, 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 no. Just answer the question, Myers. And after about 10 minutes of it... I'm so frustrated I'm about to wet myself, and I'm, I mean, I'm just, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know any of these answers to these questions. And then the thought occurred that perhaps, oh, no wonder. He's got the teacher's edition big book. He's got, he already knows all these answers because they're marked in his book, you see? And I'm thinking, okay, now I'm getting smug, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to get me one of those teacher's edition things, and then I don't have to do any of this crap. And the, re the reality of this thing, guys, is, is, that, is that in 10 minutes, Clifford had completely diagnosed me. He knew, A, I'm a real deal alcoholic. B, he knew I didn't know anything about the program of recovery. And C, he knew that I knew everything about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can be your buddy. I just can't save you from this deadly disease. And that's what he was trying to make clear to me. I knew I could connect every dot in your life. I could help you get a job. I could help you get a girlfriend. I could help you balance your checkbook. And none of, 
All of that's important. I'm not making light of any of it. But I could not help you recover. I could not because I did not know what the literature was. Did not know. And so there it was. I had a decision to make whether I wanted to stay with this old coot or whether I wanted to go on back to my other deal. And, I'm, and I'm, um, for you guys that know and have an allegiance to the groups where you, where you, where you go, I'm your buddy. I understand that allegiance. It killed me to leave that group. And i got to tell you, frankly, my, my original plan was is to go and study with these big book guys for about five or six weeks and I'd know, pick it all up, I'd know it all, and then I'd go back to my home group and I would, I would be a guru. <laughs> in my head it sounded great. I thought, shoot, I'll just do this. And um, In reality, though, it wasn't quite like that. We had two study meetings a week in those days, on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night. And on Tuesday night we'd, we'd, we'd study, they'd talk about stuff, and I'm just going... I spent all my time looking at somebody else's book trying to figure out where they're getting this stuff. And they'd... they'd, they'd you know, there's this girl that used to always sit next to me, and she'd always just kind of look over. I, it, it, got, it got laughable. As soon as they said something, she just reached over. She's looking straight ahead. She's not even looking at me. She'd just reach over, flip my pages over to the right page, and point to the paragraph. <laughs> and I'd try to be real cool and move her hand out of the way. Like, I got this now, you know. And, it's just, and the next morning, I'm on the phone to Chris going, Chris, Chris, are you, are you, do you know how long it took Bill Wilson to work this work? Do you know how long? This, I'm so excited. I can't, I can't. It's the most amazing thing. Thursday, we'd do the whole thing again. Friday morning, I'd be on the telephone to Chris down in the hill country. He's 300 miles south of me. And I'm just going, Chris, there's stuff in this book you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Chris didn't make fun of me one time. There wasn't one time he said, yeah, dummy, most of us learned that the first week we're here. <laughs> it took you seven years and some weeks to get it. <laughs> he didn't. Yeah, I was so grateful. So things get really good, and, um, um, and it's just super. And I, and, I, and I was grateful to be there and, and learned a whole lot. And I never did go back to that other, other home group. I still had friends there, but I never did. I stayed there and found that I really enjoyed the idea of teaching big book stuff. And we have these big, big, big book studies that, that go on there. And on a Tuesday night, there'll be 200 people in that room studying. And it's an amazing thing to watch and see uh, Julianne and, and Jason and some of these cats, Angie, wherever she is. Some of you guys have been to that meeting, and you know what I'm talking about, how powerful it is to watch that many people studying the literature and not sharing any ideas and weird opinions and just stuff. There's an appropriate place for sharing your experience. There's... there's close to 2,000 meetings in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now. You can do that on any of those meetings. It's, there, there's plenty of, pl of places to do that. But in, in those book studies, it's amazing to see what happens when we just stay focused on what the literature says. Let me, I want to show you something real quick. The, the, part of what we're going to do tomorrow like this is, is um, we, we, the, book, the book on page 17, they talk about this thing called a common solution. They talk about the fact that we're, not, we're joined by a common problem, right? There, we, we all know what we're is. You know, and you guys, all of you remember what it was like to be in a room full of, of drunks for the first time and how cool it was to just sit there and know that you're not being judged, that everybody understands what's going on, and, and it, just, it was just a great feeling. But in the book, then, it goes on another page. If you read down to the next paragraph, the next line, and then the, then in, then the next paragraph, it says, but that in itself would never have joined us as we're now joined. And then they talk about something called a common solution, which was in the literature. And I never knew it was there. I figured we all had our own experience and we're own, we would all just work these things in a million different ways. And the reality of this thing was is that some of us still do. The trick here and the, and the reason for the weekend, I'm hoping what we'll do is, is, is we'll begin to see that there's a lot more common ground between us than maybe we think. Um, a lot of us are already doing pretty much the same stuff. It's just that a lot of us... I, I, wanna, I want you to picture something, if you would. Be. Just imagine how confusing and conflicting it is for a new guy coming into mainstream AA today. You walk into any meeting anywhere... And, and listen to what he says. You've got, you got one guy down here talking about working the work quickly. You've got one guy down here talking about he never worked the work at all. You have a guy over here that does a step a year. You have a girl over here that says, I had a lady that in, our, in our original home group that, that stayed sober practicing yoga. You know, I've never looked at that book. I just practice yoga. I'm not knocking yoga. I've practiced it for years. I'm not knocking it. But 
understand how the new guy sitting there listening to all this stuff and we wonder why they stay so conflicted. Remember guys, the problem with NAA is not getting people to come to AAA. The problem is getting people to stay here once they're here. And there's where it gets so grindy with a lot of us. That's the reason why so many of us struggle here. I used to think I was the only guy that struggled in AA after they got here. And what I found out through this kind of stuff and through uh, uh, 150 emails a day that I get is that there are, there are tens of thousands of drunks out there dying in our rooms because they're not here in the solution that our literature carries us. Some of you guys are hip with that. Some of you guys hate that idea completely. I'm not here to argue any point, really. I'm just here to share an, a, 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 a battle that raged in me for years, for years. How could it be that I could be scooped up by so many wonderful, loving people and still stay sick? How could I do everything they asked me to do and still stay sick? And then I finally had to ask the hard question. Is it possible that all the love they could put on me was not treating the internal condition, which was alcoholism? And as soon as I understood alcoholism on the, kind of, on the nature that we're going to talk about it in the morning, as soon as I understood it, it all connected up and I understand why I didn't get well. I understood what had been missing. The love is good. Don't, don't, don't leave home without it. Don't have a meeting without love. Don't have a meeting without fellowship. Don't have a meeting without being free to share something. However, however, you've got to add some meat to it, guys. You've got to add some program in there, and the book is good for that. This is, this is excellent stuff. These days I sponsor, most of the guys that I sponsor are, are 15 to 20 years sober, and dying in AA. Either that or they've already relapsed. And I got a big old fistful of them. And most of these guys, when you talk to them, it's the funniest thing in the world. As you begin to talk to them, the very first thing they're going to let you know is, is they'll do exactly what I did sitting in Cliff's living room. They'll try to BS me and make me think that they know what they're doing. And all I got to do is ask them a couple of questions and I'll do exactly what Cliff did 21, uh, 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 all 14 years ago. I'll say, you really don't understand this, do you? And they go, I don't, I don't guess so. <laughs> and then we can make our beginning. Then we can start. And it's the coolest thing in the world. Along those lines that we were talking about, about this conflicted nature of the new guys that are in here, this is a, a great example of what I'm talking I'm so sorry. This is a great example of what I'm talking about. In, um, in 1976, 72, there was a cat named Bob Bacon that was a delegate in Ohio, and he did a talk at one of these meetings and um, this was a transcript that somebody had sent us years ago off of that talk and in this talk there's a quote uh, from Dr. Bob. Listen to this. We hear a lot of ridiculous things like there are no musts in AA. My big book read different. Now people say that it's an individual program that we can take the steps any way we want to. Dr. Bob said and I quote, there is no such thing as an individual interpretation of the 12 steps. Dig what I just said? It's important that you hear it. There is no such thing as an individual interpretation of the 12 steps. Bob didn't say that our experiences are going to be the same. He just said that there's not an individual way to interpret them. And then it wasn't three or four weeks later after we got this that somebody sent me this thing from the grapevine. It was the grapevine statement of purpose. Now the awareness that every AA member has an individual way of working the program permeates the pages of the grapevine. And throughout its history, the magazine has been a forum for the varied and often divergent opinions of AA around the world. Dig? I mean, that's as screwed up as it can get. Listen, and I'm not knocking the grapevine. I, I mean, there's some been, grapevine's done some great work over the years. But what I want to put into perspective here is that we had a quasi-connected up place like the grapevine um, that's sharing a completely opposite opinion and idea about what Dr. Bob said. And then we wonder why the new guy coming into AA stays so conflicted. Why does the brand new guy stay so jumbled up about what it is that we're supposed to be doing? I, I just, you guys get that, man. Picture this, Bill Wilson. In, in 1966, Bill Wilson wrote this letter and it was published in two or three different places. And it's an interesting thing. Remember in 1966, there is no email, right? And, and, and in 66, everything is still coming through Bill Wilson. All the good stuff that happens, Bill Wilson's still getting it. All the bad stuff that happens, Bill Wilson is still getting it. It's still resting on his shoulders. And he made this real effort. The effort ran for a couple of years trying to get people to not do what they were doing. And what they were doing was they had adopted an idea, again, brought from an outside source that they were, that, of the introduction of the discussion meeting. 
which in the initial, which it in its concept is not such a bad idea. Every one of us, um, there's nobody in here that's not sitting in a discussion meeting at some point in time and got all warm and fuzzy and got some great instruction and everything was warm with the world. Everything was a good deal. However, I doubt very seriously if there's one person in this room that has not sat in a meeting and been so uncomfortable because of what's being shared that they can't sit still. And Bill Wilson was seeing this. And that was, this is what prompted this letter. Listen to this. An AA group as such cannot take on all the personal problems of its members, let alone those of non-alcoholics in the world around us. The AA group is not, for example, a mediator of domestic relations, nor does it furnish personal financial aid to anyone. I wish I'd have read this a bunch of years ago. <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have bought you guys a Ferrari before you went home. Every one of you. Though a member may sometimes be helped in such matters by his friends in AA, the primary responsibility for the solutions of all of his problems of living and growing rests squarely upon the individual himself. Now, should an AA group attempt this sort of help, its effectiveness and energies would be hopelessly dissipated. And here's the crux of it, this last little paragraph. This is why sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of AA's 12 steps is the sole purpose of the group. If we don't stick to this cardinal principle, we shall almost certainly collapse. And if we collapse, we cannot help anyone. Hmm. That's why sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of AA's 12 steps is the sole purpose of the group. So if we're having a discussion meeting, what do we need to be talking about? The steps. The steps. Let's pull these guys with this vision of how cool it can be to get clear of this and recover from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Wouldn't that be great? You see, instead of... I'm going to go on record right now, guys, and I've done it from every podium over the last 10 years. I'm telling you right now. I, I just, people say, well, you just hate discussion meetings. Yes, I won't lie to you. I'm on fire. I, right on. I do. I do. But let me explain something. It's, it, it's not that, it's not that, here's the, here's the problem. The problem is, why is there so many of them? I just don't understand why there's not some balance in the thing. If we had a bunch of book studies where people were studying the literature so that everybody knew what to share, then when the brand new guys came walking into the room and we had a bunch of new guys in there, we would know what to share to get them to come along with us. And we wouldn't be driving them crazy. All right, there's still some holdouts, I can tell by your face. All right, I'm going to... I'm gonna... <laughs> we're going to have, a, we're gonna have a, little, a little spiritual meditation thing here. I want you to just... I want you to just... Bear with me. I want you to just, just kind of, in your head, I want you to just listen to what I'm saying. I want you to go there in your mind's eye, okay? I want you to just go right there where it is, okay? All right. You just left this big old group conscience meeting last week. You got everybody, everybody's all excited about the idea and the things that we covered. And one of the things that we covered in this group conscience meeting is that we're going to have somebody that's going to be responsible for each meeting. Now, there's a novel idea. And this chairperson is going to pick a step to talk about. We're going to talk about a, st a step, a uh, God, something that is, that is important. And everybody's all excited about it. So this is the first round of meetings after this group conscience meeting and everybody is just, is, is just, just vibrating. We're so excited. So we walk in, we sit in, we ever introduce ourselves in that particular meeting and we got a, a couple of brand new guys in there. One guy's detoxing in the room. I don't know whether he's going to make it or not. And it, it, we have some other pretty new guys in there and it's pretty exciting stuff. The, the chair guy, he says, hey, we're going to talk about step one stuff. We're not going to talk about how, what got us here. We're going to talk about, about the physical part, the mental part, the spiritual part of this whole nightmare. We're going to talk about this a little bit. So the chairman does this little five minute lead and everybody's excited because he, this kid hits it right out of the ballpark. Everybody is sitting forward in their chair, leaning on the table. It's, an, it's, it's, it's cool. You've been there in that meeting. The next girl, the girl sitting next to him, she shares next, hits it right out of the ballpark. She picks up right where he left off of. You can feel the power of a loving God move through that room. Everybody is about to just wet themselves because they're so excited that the solution is right there. These little brand new guys, these little detoxing guys are sitting there kind of scratching their head and they're looking at each other and they're going, this is the coolest stuff in the whole wide world. It happens again and again and again. we got three or four guys sharing a row. Everybody is energized. Nobody's leaving the room. Everybody's there. And then from the back, there's this guy, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Tom. Nobody's really excited about Tom sharing because they know what's coming from Tom. <laughs> Tom's just had a divorce. Tom's in the middle of some rough times. Nobody in the room's making fun of Tom. 
everybody knows Tom's hurting and Tom's our buddy, but we've been listening. this same thing for weeks now for weeks now guys in your mind's eye this isn't some mean kid from texas talking up here in your mind's eye i want you to be honest with yourself and i want you to picture what the room is doing right then i'll tell you what the room's doing half the room just went back like this in their seat and they're leaning against the back of the seat two or three of them put their head down on the table five or six of them get up and go get coffee because they know what's coming. And still there's some hope. There's some hope from crusty old guys like me that there'll be somebody in there with the cojones like a nice chairperson that will say, Tom, we love you, brother, but this is not the time to talk about that. Come see me right after the meeting. Or better still, Tom, have you shared this with your sponsor? Because perhaps he could help you with that. Okay. <laughs> I know some of you guys are going, hey, wait a minute, Tom needs a place to share too. And for everyone that thinks that, for everyone that's going there, I want you to think of one thing. And I'm going to ask you one simple question. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, even, I'm not trying to be obnoxious. I'm just trying to ask you a simple question. Where is it that Tom's right to share that was more important than those brand new guys sitting down front? Where, they have a right to hear the truth too, don't they? They have a right to walk free and clear of this deadly disease, don't they? So why is it that we have to ignore what's important to them so that he can share? It's the only question I want to ask. You see? Folks, it's time that we took our fellowship back. That we got serious about what's happening. What? There are tens of thousands of people coming into AA worldwide every day. Statistically, less than 10% of us stay a year. Statistically. And we got to own that, guys. I, we can't point a finger at somebody saying, whoa, those middle-of-the-road bastards, they did all this. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We ain't going there. We all did this together. This is about unity. This is about a unified fellowship that's going to carry a message of recovery to the drunk that still suffers. And that's why we're doing this this weekend. That's why we're doing it. Hopefully that we can get everybody kind of collected up and on the same page so that we're, we're more unified in what we do. Based on, and what we'll do is, as a novel idea, we'll use the big book as, to set the baseline for what becomes our doctrine. Remember that the goofy part here, the part that scares me sometimes on this thing is, it'd be like, this oral tradition is what gets us in trouble. Re remember those games we used to play when we were kids, that telegraph or telephone or whatever it is like this, where, where, where I whisper something in Julianne's uh, ear and she'll whisper it to Jason and Jason whispers it to this gentleman and it just goes, by the time it gets over here, this guy's already not getting the truth. And by the time, you, you poor bastards in the back, y'all are just screwed. There's no way... <laughs> There's no way the message is going to be the same when you get back there because everybody wants to put their little spin on it. And that's the reason why in a fellowship that has taken the big book out of a lot of meetings, again, you may not be in those meetings, but in where, where I go, there's meetings in the Dallas-Fort Worth area where you can't even take a big book into the meeting. They'll stop you outside. You can't even go in with one. You see? All you have in that situation is an oral tradition. And so what we would try to like to what we'd like to do as we go through this is try to set a new baseline that's established by what the book says so that we're all coming from a common place. And that's a pretty cool thing. It's a pretty powerful thing. Um, you ought to try it. I, I can tell you some of you will go kicking and screaming into it like I did. I, I was not one that embraced it all and thought because because well into my second year at primary purpose group studying the literature I'm one of the ones that still wants to share my little one-liners and my little bringing in some other stuff and this sort of you understand what I'm saying I'm just because I'm just I can't I have the toughest time coming to grips with the fact that perhaps every piece of stuff I had in those first seven years was BS and a whole lot of it was guys I just had to the trick is is figuring the trick is not learning new stuff in AA the trick is figuring out what to set down and not pick back up again that's the trick, you see? And that's what we're trying to do, is to get us to a place to where we can just gently set everything down, the, the old, the bad, the good, the ugly, everything, and then just reevaluate it and pick it up. Is this good doctrine stuff? Is this big book stuff? Take it with you. Pick it back up again as part of your doctrine. The problem is, is that most of us, if you're like me, end up with a head full of spoon-fed stuff that somebody told me in an AA meeting. 
Nobody meant me any malice or harm. Nobody was trying to jack me up. They just, we just got away from the literature. And so what, I, what became my doctrine was meeting makers make it. There it is. Guys, and I'm not saying meeting makers don't make it, but I'm telling you right now from my personal experience, there's a lot of meeting makers that get the holy crap kicked out of them. A lot of us die in AA just going to a bunch of meetings. The emphasis should never have been on just the meeting. The emphasis should be on what we do once we're at the meeting. And that's pretty cool. We'll talk about that some. Um, in the last minute or two, let me, um, I'll tie up a couple of the loose ends and then tomorrow it really will be fun. The way we've got this thing kind of set up, we've got plenty of time to ask questions and pretty time to talk some stuff. And because we're going to be here all weekend, we're kind of captive and, and uh, we walk out here, there's a big bullseye on my back and you're going, oh, get I'm safe here. A lot of guys in California don't carry guns. And so in Texas, everybody carries guns and it's always, <laughs> you can just feel the bullseyes on you everywhere you go. <laughs> it's just, it's not funny. <laughs> Here's the idea. Um, why is it important to be sure about what we're doing here? If you're ambivalent in any way about your disease, if you're ambivalent about why you're an alcoholic, if you're ambivalent about how you recovered, how many of you guys have been to birthday nights and heard somebody stand up in front of a podium going, man, I, I don't know how, I don't have a clue how I got here. <laughs> Listen, I, I used to say it too, and I understand that. I understand the sentiment. I understand the, the, the attempt at being humble. I understand that. But I also understand that wouldn't it be great if I could stand up in front of a group and tell you, hey guys, I've been sober 21 years, and I can tell you exactly how I got here exactly what I did to get here. And for the brand new guy sitting in the meeting, don't you think he's drawn to that idea that I, could, that I perhaps could pass along to him something so that he too could stay sober for 21 years? Wouldn't that be great? It would. But as long as there's... You old guys in here, you young guys won't remember, but you old guys, there was a, there was a song that Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young did years ago. And the, the only line of the song I can remember, it said, Confusion has its cost. And I remember listening to this song one night, and I, it was, it, there was nobody home but just me, and that was on, and, I, and, I, and I, confusion has its cost. And I'm thinking, isn't it the truth? Isn't it? And in AA especially, the confusion around my own disease, the confusion around how I can carry that message effectively to somebody else, Remember, a lot of us, get we, get we get let off the hook. People tell us, well, you know, if you're not a good 12-stepper, maybe you shouldn't do 12-step work. Well, I hear it all the time. Guys, five, six years. I sponsor five guys right now that are all 15-plus years of sobriety. Collectively, they've got over 100 years of sobriety between those five men. Collectively, between those five men, they've sponsored five guys. In 100 years of experience, they've sponsored five men. And when you ask them about it, They'll tell you, well, you know, I just never really felt like I had anything to offer. Did it ever occur to you to maybe get something to offer? <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> Guys, one last thing. I mean, there's a line in the big book. Remember this part of we, we, that we, on, on chapter 5 where it says we stood at the turning point? I think that building them in, in, in ways meant that we stood at the turning point every day. If I'm off the page, if I'm out there in a Neverland doing kind of strange stuff, God love you. I, I can relate to that. I understand what it's like to be there. But if you're standing at the turning point, wouldn't it be cool on a weekend like this to see if you can just entertain the idea of some novel new idea. You don't have to make it your doctrine. You don't have to even accept it for anything else other than my opinion. But wouldn't it be cool to just listen to this stuff and then spend some time reflecting? Just walk off out in the woods. Walk off out in the stick someplace. Let the bears get you. I don't... <laughs> Do they have bears up here? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gunless up here. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> These kind of situations could be the most powerful weekend that you've ever had. And I remember having weekends that were similar to this when I first started getting back into the literature and to be able to, to look at a couple of novel ideas and then to be able to walk off by myself and simply sit for a few moments and reflect on these ideas. It's amazing how much brand new stuff you can bring in and make your doctrine so that when you go back to that home group and people are floundering and 
doing all kinds of weird stuff, that you can slowly but surely pull them back, not beating them up the side of the head with a big book, not trying to annihilate them with a, with a, with a literature. We don't want to raise up a bunch of zealots. That's not what this is about. What this is about is being strong in the knowledge that our basic text carried a message that had the power to change your life forever. And that's the message that we want to carry to these little goofy fried pies like Ross. <laughs> Thank you very much.